Welcome and thanks for joining us. My guest today is Frank Reyes. He's the Managing Director for Software and Infrastructure Capabilities at Maximus. Frank, good to have you with us. Thanks for having me, Tom. Let's talk about our topic of the day, so to speak, and that is cloud security, ever moving target like the clouds themselves. What are you seeing in terms of trends in cloud security versus say a year ago or two years ago? What do agencies need to know these days? Well, I think with cloud security, we're actually seeing them taking that as a distinct area of concern beyond just security writ large uh, for that. And the reason is, is the way agencies had been operating their IT infrastructure in the past is demonstratively different to a degree moving to the cloud. There are a great deal of benefits that come with the shared responsibility model of operating the cloud, but with that, there's additional, I would say, contours of the cloud that have to be noted for. And that's really coming to light. We're starting to see where the existing tools, processes, and even skill sets are a little bit lacking to that new operating model of being in the cloud, per se. Give us an example, maybe, of some of the contours. What's different? Sure. So in the past, you might have a traditional database administrator that controlled the passwords and credentials into a database within your data center. And you would go to that database administrator to get those credentials. In the cloud, that's not necessarily how it works. There, for most part, aren't database administrators. They're cloud engineers or DevOps engineers that are provisioning their databases on their own. And they are controlling the credentialing at the point there. Now, taking those credentials, those passwords, those login information and centralizing them has to be a new muscle memory for it, for an organization. And so that's one of the areas. Same thing in the other piece parts of compute, networking, and storage. Got it, yeah, so that really gets back to that totally different infrastructure that you mentioned at the outset. The other term we hear a lot is containers, containerizing, containerization, and container security. And that's, talk about skill sets and knowledge, totally different from the way people managed, you know, say in the packet days. Yeah. <laughs> so tell us, what is that exactly? Maybe give us a little explainer on containerization and container security. Sure, it's always good that I like to call, you know, go back to the IT history machine of starting off <laughs> where, you know, uh, we, we so those who are in IT probably remember the days of when you were operating a server in a closet, 19-inch rack as, as, as uh, the terminology would be, and that's where you ran your workloads, as they're called, right, your compute. And then we realized that we wanted to consolidate all these various servers around, you know, the offices that we have, and so we moved from servers and closets to consolidated data centers. And then we started to move to, let's have these leased data centers. And then from data centers, we started to realize, hey, it's not really the server that's important, Maybe we can just use a portion of the servers because what we're really realizing is that the server for the most of the part, most of the time, wasn't fully utilized. Mm -hmm. It was over provisioned, as they would say, in excess capacity. So then came about came about virtual machines. We may have hear of you know virtualization, and that was how can we partition the compute resources within a server? Containers are the next evolution of that. Is within a server? How do we even further get a granularity to have our compute resources be even more isolated and use just as just the specific amount of resources that it needs and then isolate that from the rest of the mm -hmm. entire infrastructure of the hardware for it. Um, and so what that, com what that comes with is it reduces your blast radius as it's called. If, if there is a vulnerability, it's just isolated to that one container. And within that container, it contains everything you need to run your application, your code, your libraries, and your configuration files, all in one image as it's known as. And, that, and an image is just a file that represents that container. So beforehand it was a lot of manual work, now it's one file that has all this, and it allows us to really scale applications and build what is also known as microservices. That's really where that came from. So how big is a container? Oh. Uh, <laughs> Uh, that's a great question. Um, it is. Uh, it it can be um, not really. It's not a physical thing, right? No, no, understood. I meant in terms of like 
Memory. Oh, oh yeah, like yeah. memory. Uh, storage. Oh, yeah, yeah storage-wise. So you can make it, you can make it, it's just as you would provision a server back uh, in the day or you would uh, size a specific virtual machine. You can, it's elastic, so you can make a container as large as you need to for the, the work that it needs to do. But that's counterproductive. That's not actually a pattern that we would do. We want to keep that container as small as possible to make it just do exactly what that container needs to do in your application. Because these containers, they are brought up dynamically and they are eliminated dynamically mm -hmm. as well. They're only brought online when they're needed. So you want to keep that as small as possible. You don't need a big party bus to just move one person down the road. So it sounds like containers are fundamentally different from virtual machines where you have the whole compute resource moving as a virtual machine and it goes away in totality or is wound up in totality. Whereas you could almost assemble what you need for that particular workload from your container library, is that the right word? Yes, um, so yes, so you store your container images, right, that file um, in a container registry, which is, to your point, a, like a library. And that's where you move into um, a compute hardware resource to do that, and yes, the whole goal was to decouple the underlying operating system and all of the things that, all the infrastructure that's required to run it away from the actual logic that is needed to run that application. Yeah, it's almost like mini mainframes again. Uh, you know, uh, they say, you know, when IT, 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 you, you don't have to worry about IT, it'll eventually all come back to it, right? <laughs> um, think clients are definitely where we're going to get to one day, for sure. Sure. And container security, then, that sounds like that takes a fundamentally different approach, getting back to skills and so forth, than, say, VM security or server security, where everything was... You're, you're, you're right, Tom. Uh, as you embark on using a new tool set, um, comes with it some of the additional um, tooling to come with it. So what we what you see there is you have to think of networking differently so that containers can talk to each other. The, you can actually have containers that help containers work called sidecars. Uh, and each of these additional areas of how you go from writing the code to putting that code into a development pipeline to get to an image storing that, that image in a repository and then deploying that on a container and a container platform. Because you're going to need, you know, if you most likely have more than one container for your application, you have a variety of containers doing, making up your application. So you have an orchestrator to kind of help with all that. Mm -hmm. So there's all these additional tools in there that also need to be aware of. And so if you're thinking, I was just operating VMs on a server, there's now this whole line of tool chain that is that you have to learn and be mindful of as well. Yeah, so then from the standpoint of cybersecurity, how, how do hackers, how does malware get to a containerized application? I mean, it sounds like a different mechanism than you would have experienced in earlier versions like VMs or just non-virtual machines running. It used to be where people or where adversaries were trying to attack the data center, the infra underlying infrastructure first. Uh, and with the shared security model, the cloud service providers have done a, an amazing job of really securing the cloud itself so that you just have to focus on securing your data and your application in the cloud for it. And what we've seen is the adversaries for containerized workloads have pivoted to, and you've probably heard this, going after the software supply chain. Mm -hmm. I have to get to now you a lot earlier because if I, down the road, a lot of that gets, is really robustly secure these days. Because now it's not just your organization, it is the large CSPs that are coming in also to help. So that becomes a harder target. So that's where they're really focusing on that software piece. And that's why as you look through your pipeline of where where your vulnerabilities are going to come in, it's going to come into your secure, your, your essentially your supply chain risk management for your software. You how you're maintaining your access to your re registries, right? Your mm -hmm. library now becomes mm -hmm. super important. The credentials, secrets, and sensitive information, whether you use a a separate tool um, to house those. That's now becomes the attack surface that someone wants to go after. 
because now you're looking at what, is, what does it take of all of the piece parts for me to get that container out and deployed is where can I come into that? Uh, because once it's up and running, it becomes a lot more difficult for me to get in there and do something about that as an adversary. So they're going to move all the way to the left. And just thinking about a container from a hacker standpoint, does a container have an IP address or is that some internal registry that's only for that system? They have an IP address, but they're dynamic IP addresses. So as I mentioned, you stand mm -hmm. up containers as the man comes on and then you release them as, as it's no longer needed. So you're standing up the underlying right. infrastructure as you need to. And that is actually a, a very good pattern. Uh, a great pattern is that you're constantly, you're changing your environment. Your, your environment's so dynamic that it becomes difficult that if an adversary had got in, gotten in, it's changing every couple of hours that you know, you're, you're cutting off access to there. So that provides actually a, a certain uh, level of security benefit that they are ephemeral. And not to get too deep into the weeds, but the ephemeral or changing disposable IP addresses, are those reused? I mean, even in IP version six. So yeah, so um, that's actually one of the challenges when you have container workloads and you're using, I would argue, legacy security tooling that just looks at vulnerabilities as an IP address. And the way it says is, hey, I saw a vulnerability on IP address, you know, one, mm -hmm. 192 dot whatever. And then it goes back and says, hey, this IP address came up again. Well, it may not have the same vulnerability or that vulnerability may still be, but it's now going to link to another machine because the IP address had just changed. So you might get false positive that, hey, since that IP address was reassigned to another hardware asset, it's not that you actually fix it, it's just now going on a new machine and vice versa. Just because it has, uh, you, you, you do see it again, doesn't mean that, that it's a false. So what, what that all means is that sec um, container security tools are really emerging in the public sector. How do you see inside your containers? Because to some degree, containers are like a black box. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's really where you're seeing a lot of, and we are specifically, seeing customers asking about how can I get visibility to my containers? What kind of um, container security toolings should I be investing in? Or at this point, piloting to see greater um, um, aspects. How do I move beyond just application security, but now really deeper into the runtime security, looking at my side cards that are helping my containers and so on. This all sounds like you need not just different tooling, but different skill sets, because it sounds totally unlike what traditional cybersecurity and dating back to computer security really was all about, which was perimeter defense of a network. Yeah, I don't envy the modern day CISO's job um, because the scale velocity in which the security landscape and the threats to that and the underlying um, products and capabilities and tools that are available to you are changing so fast. Um, it is a challenge because not only are security professionals having to be mindful and maintaining the legacy architecture and systems that they have and throughout, you know, both in commercial and in, mm -hmm. in uh, public sector industries. They're now also having to accommodate those, uh, those parts of their organization that are f a further ahead in their technology maturity curve and supporting those and having to provide the same risk posture throughout the organization, right? They don't get to say, well, my legacy is going to be at this risk posture and my, secure, and my um, uh, newer technology is going to be at this. It's, they have to look at it holistically. So yes, so those individuals in the security both have to learn more about the technology, the capabilities and the limitations are there. Also learning what new tools are coming to help fill those gaps in. And then really understanding where do I have to divest myself of legacy tools that are no longer providing me the value that I thought they used to. In reality, they're creating a blind spot in my ecosystem. How does all this relate to the security operations center then? What do they look for? Yeah, so you know, traditionally, you know, security operations centers are organizations that were just looking at logs, right? Mm -hmm. They would have some type of uh, SIEM tool that came in and they're doing queries and analysis on uh, logs. Or if they're moving a little bit more forward, they have some automation that gives them alerts. And then they're going to follow up on those alerts and then providing that information back to those development teams. That process, just in me just talking to you, is just too slow. 
mm -hmm. in the modern um, application. Uh, and, and given that our adversaries are moving way faster than that. So what is needed is, is not only, as, as we've seen application owners modernize in their software development practices with product owners, um, product managers, using Agile, using mm -hmm. cloud-native application development, and a whole host of others, and they're using modern infrastructure, the SOCs have to modernize as well to keep up with that. And they're going to have to start changing their operating model to account for this new ecosystem of IT that they have to now um, essentially be the guardians of. All right, and uh, when you think of containers, the way you've described them, it sounds like a process system as opposed to like a static system. There's a constant dynamic assembly, reassembly, reposting, taking down of containers. It sounds like ops. So maybe talk about uh, cyber ops and workflow associated with all of this containerization use. It sounds like that's got to be the overlay of how you handle it. Right, you know, uh, <laughs> CyberOx is part of, you know, the bigger security ops, right? And if you, you know, if you're kind of going through the, 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 the nomenclature of the DevSecOps model of the development uh, security and operations, right? That's going to be a big, big area of bringing that back in. And we have seen organizations bringing in security professionals in their development and operations teams. Um, and that integration <laughs> is really, really key. And you can't, you know, you can have a team that focuses on security operations, you know, or in cyber ops, but you have to have these integrated teams that really are with developers and the teams that are responsible for maintaining and operating the capability once um, in production, working together for there. And so they're going to have to have their own workflows, right? Because what you're going to have is one of your um, security professionals on that DevSecOps team seeing something, working with their developers and their operations uh, teams, and kind of giving them advisories, helping them be that advisor on the ground. And then when they're seeing something of a macro, have a reach back with a workflow system to say, hey, back to the security operations centers with our entire cyber ops organization, this is what I'm seeing in my application. What are you seeing over there? What are you bringing that? This whole network effect, just as we look at uh, a graph, right? That's really where you know, modern cyber ops is going to have to turn into, a, instead of a linear, here's logs in, here's you know alerts and uh, um, traffic light charts, red, green, mm -hmm. high critical moves. It's going to have to be more of a graph ecosystem of when I see something here, I'm going to respond almost like antibodies across my organization and share that information really, really quickly um, because our adversaries are operating in that model for it. And with hybrid infrastructures, because you have multiple clouds in the typical agency, but they also have their own data centers, are data centers, are you seeing their uh, iteration such that they can emulate the cloud because you don't want to develop for a containerized situation here but still have an old-fashioned deployment there in your own cloud. That is, can, can the DevSecOps and CyberOps teams just create something once, whether for the data center or the cloud? It is, so that, that's actually the, you, know, you asked like the existential question that is right <laughs> now. Um, how, you know, yes, it makes sense on paper to have this great, you know, big thing, but when you actually get to the ground of it, it is very, very hard. And I have, have not seen um, any organizations doing that at scale. They are kind of almost um, saying, I have an operating model for this part of my organization that mm -hmm. is more modern, and I have an operating model for this, part, for this other part here. Because, to your point, that adds a great deal of complexity, a learning curve that hasn't been achieved just yet. And also working across many organizations. As we know, in the federal government, um, there isn't the engineering department that has everything all under, like maybe on commercial, there's usually the vice president of engineering, and that individual oversees software, infrastructure, product development, mm -hmm. and they, they, they own it all. 
um, and they work with IT and the, and the CIO's office as well for shared services. That's just not how most um, uh, agencies are organized. And because of that, that's, I think, a process ish, mm -hmm. uh, challenge there um, from that model being effective. Also, we, you know, we have heard of interest uh, back um, in the executive order in 2021 of uh, chief product security officers. Um, and that's one of the ways that some agencies are getting at the, I'm going to have the CISO, the chief information security officer, we're, we're focus on the traditional risks that come from um, operating an, an IT organization. And I'm going to have the chief security product officer focus on the newer operating models that I'm on. That is secure by design, secure coding, secure CICD pipelines, continuous integration, continuous deployment pipelines. I'm going to do threat hunting, threat modeling. I'm going to do more of that stuff that I have to do, container security mm -hmm. being them. And, I'm going to, and that security professional is going to be responsible for that part of it. While the organization still has to, because at the end of the day, operations take over modernization every day. So that person needs to be laser focused on keeping the lights on and running while other parts of the organization are modernizing. And that's why I think you know those individuals, those those agencies. CISA has made a has made a reference to it. Um, I have not seen any organizations really stand that up, but I think that that's where we're going to see moving forward until we get to that becomes a new state, and then it matures over. I want to thank today's guest, Frank Reyes, is the managing director for software and infrastructure capabilities at Maximus. I'm Federal Drive host Tom Temin. You're watching Federal News Network. Let's go back to the studio now for more on the cloud exchange.